Hey guys, bear with me here. Tears of the Kingdom is a phenomenal game, no one needs me to tell them that, but I'm going to be taking a critical and partially subjective look at it today. At the time of this video's release, it's still benefiting from the effects of New Hotness Syndrome, but I hope we can all be mature and look at a slightly less flattering take than what the majority of online discourse is churning out right now. Considering there's a very successful video out there called Breath of the Wild is not a masterpiece that was received quite well, I'd like to think we can. I'm not here to be a contrarian, and I genuinely really liked Tears of the Kingdom. I just didn't fall madly in love with it in the way I did with Breath of the Wild, and I want to talk about why. I have a lot of less than favorable things to say about Tears, but I also have a good number of positive things I will be covering, so please be patient when I'm picking it apart. I always avoid ending videos on downer notes whenever possible, and it's definitely possible in this case. Also, a quick warning, I am going to be talking full story spoilers, as well as briefly discussing one optional subplot surrounding a certain fan-favorite joke villain from Breath of the Wild, but not until around halfway through the video, and I'll give a heads up before these spoilers commence. Tears of the Kingdom may not have set my world on fire, but it's still a 10 out of 10 game, and I definitely think that its best moments are worth experiencing blind, so I do suggest tuning out before spoiler talk begins if you haven't finished the main questline yet. I'd say if you've completed even one temple, you should be safe until then, although there will be some brief footage of all four temple bosses. With all that out of the way, I want to start by taking a look at Breath of the Wild and talking about what made it such a special game to me. 2017 was an insane year for Nintendo. Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild were like the second coming of perennial classics Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time for me personally. I'm a video game enthusiast, but I'm also a critic, and I have a cynical streak which causes me to not always align with group hype. This was not the case for Mario and Link's launch releases on the Switch. I say this with no irony. Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild made me feel like a little kid experiencing those N64 classics for the first time all over again. They are magical games to me. They perfectly capture everything I loved about those genre-defining titles while still feeling decidedly more modern. I adore them. They're two of my favorite games of all time. And I know that this is a huge cliché in the gaming sphere, but this tale as old as time is true for me as well. Ocarina of Time got me into video games. It is the reason I am such a passionate player to this day. It is the reason games are my favorite hobby, and it's essentially the indirect reason that this channel even exists. I was aware of video games as a concept since long before I played that game, but none of the older Game Boy Color, or N64, or even Game Boy Advance titles I demoed at friends' houses made me jump up and decide I needed to own a console. Not even Mario 64. I actually didn't play Ocarina at release, or even know it existed. My first exposure to it came after Majora's Mask was released, and shortly before the launch of Wind Waker. In fact, my introduction to Ocarina was basically a coincidence. It was candidly shown off to me by my sister's friend's older friend one day when my parents were picking her up. It's too convoluted to explain the details. But the 30 minutes I accidentally spent with Ocarina of Time that day were the pinnacle. That game was pure magic to my young mind, so immersive and lived in that I spent hours in the coming weeks just imagining what laid beyond the borders of the Cookery Forest, which I hadn't even left in my brief demo time. I was fixated. I needed to own a console. I needed to play that game. All this is to say, I owe my passion for video games in general entirely to Ocarina of Time, and by extension, the Legend of Zelda series. I love these games. Now let's fast forward to Skyward Sword. I hated that game. Hated it. Didn't even finish it when it first released. I don't even think I made it halfway. Skyward Sword is not a bad game, objectively speaking, but it completely lacked the qualities that I valued in Zelda games. The magic, the sheer unbridled immersion, the lived-in feeling of those sprawling fantasy vistas. Skyward Sword didn't feel like a world or an epic, it felt like a game. 
I remember in a pre-launch interview, one of the devs said almost verbatim that basically the entire game is like one big dungeon. And at the time, I was thinking to myself, wow, what a bunch of vapid PR speak. But he was absolutely spot on. Skyward Sword is what you would get if you stripped away all of the world-building elements of Zelda and just injected dungeon design into every fiber of its game space. There's definitely a place for that, but it's not what I came to Zelda for. It technically was a continuation of the formula established by Ocarina of Time that had been followed quite religiously in the majority of entries that followed it, but it was the most rigidly constrained version of that formula that I had seen to date. Breath of the Wild, then, was an absolute breath of fresh air, pardon the pun. Everything about it was so fresh and new and different, but it still kept so many classic series staples and elements while reimagining them in an enticingly novel form. Sure, it added plenty of new abilities, such as the Magnesis, Cryonis, and Stasis Sheikah runes, but what impressed me most in Breath of the Wild was how it adapted all the series' legacy items and concepts. In past Zeldas, even Link's more mundane items, like the bow, are treated with such gravitas, like they're the only copy of said item in existence. Like, Link has to go through half a game and fight his way through a spooky dungeon full of hideous undead monsters just to get his hands on a bow, and a quiver of arrows that can hold like 10 rounds. And this bow is treated like some magical item bestowed from on high by divine beings, and nobody else in the entire kingdom has ever held one or even heard of archery. But in Breath of the Wild, you can just grab a bow off the ground, or a fallen enemy. They're just a thing that exists, and I know it's simple and silly, but I love that. In past games, Link could wield a short sword and one of like two shields, but now he can pair any one-handed weapon with a whole array of shields. Weapons like the Biggeron Sword, which was also treated with all this gravitas, like no one in Hyrule had invented the Claymore yet, and you had to go on this insane timed trading quest just to obtain, are also represented in the form of a whole arsenal of two-handed weapons. You no longer had Bomb Flowers or the Bomb Bag, but you had the remote Bomb Rune, so bombs remained. Fire, ice, and bomb arrows returned as well, and even the boomerang was represented by the existence of a small subset of short sword type weapons with a boomerang shape and property when thrown. But it doesn't stop there. In the Sheikah Slate itself, you could find other miscellaneous goodies Link had always made use of in previous entries. The Sheikah Slate's screen serves as your map and compass, but also as your telescope, picto box, and warp system. Link could once again ride horses, but it wasn't rigidly restricted to just Epona, like she was the only able-bodied horse in all of Hyrule. You could tame any wild horse you found, and they even had unique looks and stats, making it worthwhile to tame a small stable's worth. What I'm trying to get at here is that Breath of the Wild took all of these pre-established Zelda staples, which in the past had been treated as these one-of-a-kind treasures that were doled out in a drip-fed, rigidly structured, one-per-dungeon fashion, and reinvented them as tools in a toolbox, which you could find anywhere and shift through any variety of on the fly. It took a theme park and turned it into a sandbox, and it was incredible. It truly took my breath away, in the same way Ocarina of Time did all those years earlier. And the fact that it accomplished this with a jaded adult, rather than a starry-eyed kid, makes it ten times more impressive in my book. Oh, and the break with tradition on Link's new look didn't hurt either. And the funny thing is, Breath of the Wild actually helped me appreciate Skyward Sword more. After I had a couple of Breath playthroughs under my belt, the Zelda I had always wanted and didn't even know, I was able to return to Skyward Sword in its HD re-release and appreciate it on its own terms, knowing what I was getting into. It's still easily my least favorite 3D Zelda, but as the polar opposite of Breath of the Wild, this hyper-gamey Zelda entry with Link back in his classic green tunic and pointy cap was actually a tasty palate cleanser after all these years. And you would think that after this palate cleanser, I would be raring to go for Breath of the Wild's direct sequel, and a return to the format I fell so hard for. But while I definitely enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom, it just did not have that same spark to me, and I spent a good portion of my time with it trying to figure out why that was. 
It is incredibly iterative, but I'm a big Mega Man fan, and those games are super iterative, almost insultingly so. So what's the difference? Well, for one thing, Mega Man games are incredibly short, bite-sized packets of fun. They never overstay their welcome, so a new coat of paint and set of levels once every year or two is just what the doctor ordered. But that's the thing, isn't it? A new set of levels. Let's first address probably the only thing that anyone can even think to criticize Tears of the Kingdom for right now. It wholesale lifts and recycles Breath of the Wild's map. Just the entire game world, copy and pasted. You would think with how massive it is that the blow of such a recycling would be softened. Like, nobody's got every inch of it memorized, it's positively gargantuan. But for me, that actually ended up hurting it more. It's so big that when you recycle it, I feel the empty space more, and schlepping across open fields just to revisit places I've spent so much time in already was honestly kind of a chore. When this map was new, every vista was full of wonder. I felt like I could find any treasure or amazing secret at literally every turn. Exploration was fun because everything was new. Everything was a mystery and everything looked strikingly beautiful. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not insane. Obviously, Tears of the Kingdom added a ton of new content, and I'm gonna get to that and give it its due, but the surface of Hyrule is still the fundamental foundation of this world, and even with the addition of things like caves and wells, and the changes which have occurred at major towns and landmarks, I couldn't help but feel like Tears of the Kingdom was sorely lacking its own identity. It's funny, there was a period of time a few years back where it was like in vogue to rip on Twilight Princess for not having its own identity. And let me tell you something, Twilight Princess has identity in spades. It is not just a clone of Ocarina of Time. Even if it feels like a soft reboot of it in some areas, keep in mind that Majora's Mask and Wind Waker released between those two titles, so any similarities they had were basically fresh again. But beyond that, Twilight Princess has always felt unique to me. Its darker, more somber tone, fully adult hero, intriguing and layered companion character, wolf transformation, and of course, the haunting and at times terrifying Twilight Realm. Yes, it was a return to traditional Hyrule, but that was after two games spent away. Orden Village may be in a forested area, but it still feels totally distinct from the enchanted and child-ruled Cookery Forest. Kakariko Village, Death Mountain, and Zoro's Domain may have returned, but they've been totally redesigned, and their respective races have been modeled in appreciably greater detail than the last time we saw them. Even if you're inclined to see Twilight Princess as little more than Ocarina 2.0, I feel the upgrade is substantial enough to warrant its existence, and as far as I'm concerned, it absolutely does have its own identity. So, it surprises me that this same fanbase, which was so quick to throw Twilight Princess under the bus for not having its own identity because it's kind of similar to Ocarina of Time, is now turning around and saying things like, Tears of the Kingdom is such a massive step up from Breath of the Wild that it makes the latter look like a tech demo. Bitch, please. Tears of the Kingdom is only standing as tall as it is because it's standing literally on the shoulders of another giant to begin with. For all the people who love throwing around the line, Twilight Princess is a good game, but I don't respect it because it's just copying Ocarina of Time. Look me in the eyes and tell me that you're not holding Twilight Princess to a complete double standard when set next to Tears of the Kingdom. This is the same game as Breath of the Wild. After six years of waiting, it really is very much Breath of the Wild again. And for all the changes Tears of the Kingdom actually brings to the table, I have to say, I don't even like a lot of them. First, let's talk weapons. I'm in the camp that actually really liked the weapon durability mechanic in Breath of the Wild. I feel it adds to that survivalist, improvisatory feel of the game. There's nothing more satisfying than chucking a weapon you know is about to break into an enemy's face for double damage on that last hit, and then darting forward to pick up the weapon they just dropped, knowing that because you now have it, they can't use it and their attacks will hurt less as a result. 
But even beyond that, I loved the designs of those weapons. A game's aesthetics are extremely important to me. Not its graphics, its aesthetics. Not how many polygons objects have, but how they actually look. All of the gear and equipment you find in Breath of the Wild looks fantastic. Even the weak, early game equipment is fun to look at and has a pleasing design. And once you graduate from Boko Clubs and Traveler Swords to Knights Claymores and Royal Guard Broadswords, that brings a whole new set of satisfaction. And it's the same for bows, shields, etc. Breath of the Wild's artists clearly put a lot of care into the visual designs of Link's gear. And Tears of the Kingdom doesn't exactly shit on that, but it sure tries to. Now, I like the idea here. Ganon's magic caused all the weapons across the land to instantly rust, forcing people to reinforce them with other materials. Nintendo did a very bad job showing how cool this could be in the game's final preview, however, and instead chose to focus on its goofier applications. I have to say, I was not impressed when they stuck a pitchfork onto a stick or whatever to make that comically long eyesore of a spear when they were demonstrating the fuse room, and I was genuinely scared that this was what all weapon fusion was going to be like. Fortunately, Tears of the Kingdom didn't totally sacrifice weapon aesthetics in the way this preview implied. While you absolutely can make garbage like that if it tickles your fancy, what you're supposed to do is fuse high damage yielding monster parts onto your weapons, which in the best case scenario, aesthetically speaking, keeps the hilt but replaces the damaged and rusted blade. In the worst case scenario, however, you have like a big black pine cone sticking to the end of your still rusty blade, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Aonuma, but if you stick a bowling ball to the edge of a rusted sword and then hit someone with the blade, it's still going to shatter. And regardless, I don't think the aesthetic hit that all the weapons took was worth the added customization for a bunch of stuff you're meant to use until breaking and then replace anyway. Like, my experience was not greatly enhanced by removing those nice-looking mining hammers in favor of gluing rocks onto sticks like a caveman. I'm sorry. The larger issue with this, however, is a mechanical one. In theory, I like that monster parts now have even more utility than they used to, but in practice, this is itself a double-edged sword, because you still need often unreasonable amounts of them in order to upgrade your armor sets at the Great Fairy. And this upgrade process is arguably more important than doing shrines, because in these two games, three heart containers with maxed out defense will last you a hell of a lot longer than 20 heart containers with non-upgraded armor. And this isn't meaningful decision-making either. It's not about allocating finite resources for character building. It's just a question of, do I sacrifice this monster part knowing I may have to farm more of it later to upgrade some armor piece? Or do I hoard my monster parts and accept all my weapons sucking ass to ensure I don't have to grind later? Monster parts being relegated to armor upgrades, but still having a use as elixir ingredients and kilt and currency in Breath of the Wild was the better balance, in my opinion. They still had value, but kept grinding to an absolute minimum. Which brings me to yet another point. For all the new additions Tears of the Kingdom brings, it somehow left some really obvious quality of life and fundamental game design issues totally untouched. You still can't see what parts your armor needs for its next upgrade without visiting the Great Fairy, Flurry Rush is still completely broken if you're good at pulling it off, and combat is still largely too easy because Link can store like 999 apples and 20 plus full course meals in his pocket which he can eat instantly from the comfort of the pause menu. This doesn't even help to mitigate early game combat difficulty though, because like in Breath of the Wild, the defense stat seems to function in thresholds, such that everything is either one-shotting you if you're sub-10 heart containers and two-shotting you if you're sub-20, or doing a quarter heart of damage regardless of your heart count and therefore not threatening you at all. There just never seems to be a healthy in-between here. 
Also, the shrines in Breath of the Wild were very deliberately placed, especially the ones which served as fast travel spots to major towns and points of interest. But because Tears of the Kingdom felt the need to rearrange all of them on principle, none of the importantly placed ones seemed to make as much sense to me as they did originally. I swear, half the ones placed by stables make it so that you can't actually see the stable when you first arrive and have to reorient yourself and look around a clump of trees or something, and there is not a single one placed conveniently relative to a great fairy, someone who you're going to be visiting very frequently. I happened to get Robbie over to the Hateno lab very late into my playthrough, which meant I didn't have a travel medallion for like 80% of it, and spent way too much time hoofing it uphill for like 120 agonizing seconds every single time I wanted to visit a fairy. I also didn't love the new type of Korok Seed subtask where you need to transport one lethargic Korok to his friend's campsite. I appreciate that you get two seeds for your effort instead of one, but I felt like these made up the majority of Korok tasks I came across, and they were always agonizingly far apart. So when their friend was in the totally opposite direction of where I was headed, I just couldn't be bothered. Furthermore, this is an admittedly petty nitpick, but Tears of the Kingdom made an aesthetic decision around the Zora scenario that really bothered me. So I adore the armor sets in the Switch Zeldas. This is another early entry concept that got adapted and expanded on beautifully in Breath of the Wild. Mario Odyssey, too. I never realized how much I've wanted to dress Link and Mario up in different outfits, but I digress. My point is, when I play these two titles, I really like dressing Link in the regional garb relevant to where he is. Sort of like a when in Rome thing. You know, I like putting Link in his cozy snow quill garb when he's helping out the Rito in the Hebra region. I enjoy donning the Flamebreaker armor when diving into volcanic caves and mines to help out the Gorons. You get the idea. So this is silly, but I got genuinely annoyed that Tears of the Kingdom withheld the final piece of Zora armor until after completing the Water Temple. Like, just let me go full Zora for this set piece. Breath of the Wild let me do it. And if you're gonna withhold any One Piece, withhold the helmet for God's sake. These outfits generally look complete without the headpiece, and the Hylian hood is like Guile's theme. It goes with everything. Withholding the greaves so that I can put on the top and helmet, but have to just swap in a non-matching pair of pants is just tasteless. Oh, and while I'm on the subject of petty nitpicks, can we please stop treating the Hylian shield like it's the shield equivalent of the Master Sword? It's not. Skyward Sword did this, and then it just became a thing, apparently. Look, the Hylian shield is iconic. It has a great design, it's a fan favorite, but it was always a mass production model meant for low-ranking Hylian soldiers and even general populace consumption. You could buy an infinite supply of them in Ocarina for a measly 80 rupees a pop, and it was outclassed by the Mirror Shield. It was indestructible in Twilight Princess, but that's only because that game didn't have the mechanic where like likes can eat metal shields, and the Mirror Shield didn't appear. The Hylian Shield was still casually purchased at a general store for a slight markup due to it being the last one in stock. Aonuma, please stop making me jump through these ridiculous hoops just to nab one and then pay out Link's life savings just to replace it when it breaks. Anyway, after a lot of reflection, I finally figured out what was really bothering me as I re-explored this largely repeated Hyrule what was really getting under my skin, and even sapping my patience for completing shrines. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom both share an aspect of fundamental design that, come to think of it, actually reminds me of mobile game design, of all things. What I mean is, in both of these games, the act of strengthening Link, the act of powering him up, is almost completely divorced from the act of progressing the narrative. Unlike in older Zelda titles, acquiring new items and power-ups in the Switch Zeldas is fundamentally tied to the act of exploring. Yes, exploring off the beaten path yielded small rewards in older Zeldas, but the big stuff, the dungeon items, full heart containers, and so on, were found by progressing through the dungeons which the plot organically led you through. 
I didn't mind this divorce of mechanical and narrative progression in Breath of the Wild, however, because again, everything was new. The whole map, the whole incarnation of Hyrule was fresh and novel, which gave side exploration a priceless amount of intrinsic value. Tears of the Kingdom, on the other hand, just didn't benefit from this in the same way. Every trek back to a familiar locale, even most moments spent inside the brand new shrines, were kind of marred by the sense of, I have to do this again so I can get strong enough to actually experience the new story content in this recycled world. It almost turned the act of exploring into a form of grinding, and I didn't even think that was possible. Also, why do I have to do this, like, six side quest long marathon to help out with Hateno's dumbass mayoral election just to unlock the ability to have CC lower Link's hood? Who approved this? I seriously love the new hood down look, but I spent like a whole ass real world afternoon just trying to accomplish this stupid aesthetic adjustment that frankly should have been an out of the box menu toggle. Unbelievable. And this is exactly the kind of weirdly rigid thing that would have been accepted in old Zelda games, but Breath of the Wild would have done away with for making no sense. Anyway, let's talk about the real new stuff. The actual draws of this sequel. I want to give the Skylands and the Depths their fair due, but in truth, they didn't really do it for me completely either. Let's look to the sky for starters. Oh, look at that, another double-edged sword. I'm sorry, I'm genuinely not trying to be petty, but I feel that the Skylands came bundled with one major aesthetic caveat. You see, it's basically impossible to make well-crafted, gameplay-oriented, geographic geometry look good when viewed wholesale from a distance, which means the price of the new Skyward content is that the sky itself is littered with these massive eyesore hunks of level geometry, just floating around like something I amateurishly threw together in a player-made Disney Infinity map. The Skylands actually look fine when viewed from other Skylands up in the sky, but from the surface of Hyrule, they're just, they're an eyesore. I can't think of any other way to put it. They've absolutely polluted Breath of the Wild's gorgeous, flawless vistas. More importantly, however, is that the total game space covered by them isn't nearly as great or visually varied as the space encompassed by the surface below, so I'd hardly consider them a consolation for the lack of a new map. In fairness to Tears of the Kingdom, however, they were not intended to be, at least not on their own. The depths were the only thing Nintendo kept fully under wraps before the game's launch barring the leaks, of course, and they definitely felt like the game's strongest attempt to offer a substantially sized new map and an atmosphere unique enough to help lend this otherwise recycle fest an identity of its own. Now, the depths are essentially the same size as the surface of Hyrule above, which is quite a feat, and they even have roughly the same amount of verticality, which is genuinely impressive. I appreciated the spookier atmosphere as well, and overall, the depths kind of felt like a halfway point between the Twilight Realm from Twilight Princess and Dark Aether from Metroid Prime 2. They're dark, oppressive, and thanks to the new gloom status which all enemies there can inflict on you with one touch, they're decidedly more dangerous. Unfortunately, even the depths couldn't quite do enough to shake Tears of the Kingdom's lack of an individual identity for me personally. The atmosphere down there is unique, sure, but as you light up more and more of it, you see that it all kind of has the same atmosphere. It has verticality, but it's largely one note aesthetically. So the fact that it's the full size of the surface ended up making it feel more monotonous for me than it ought to. Additionally, the fact that it's so dangerous meant that I basically slept on it until around 70% of my way through the game, so my time with it was largely backloaded, which only further compounded the tedium of its one-note atmosphere. Also, I know that the geography down there is supposed to be an inversion of the surface, with mountains becoming valleys and vice versa, as well as rivers becoming impassable walls, but I swear that inversion principle is fucking bullshit for the entire northwestern quadrant of the map. I could not get anywhere in that goddamn hellscape of infinitely vertical walls, even while actively referring to my surface map. 
I'm sure it's just a skill issue, but it drove me insane and ended up prematurely ending one of my excursions for marked treasure spots in frustration. Also, I hate needing to follow statues everywhere to make my way to points of interest because the alternative is running into all these unscalable sheer vertical cliffs. I'm sorry. Anyway, ultimately, I didn't end up viewing the depths as a whole second map so much as another palette cleanser activity to engage in whenever I was in the market for some precious zonite ore or just wanted a little break from retracing my steps in Hyrule. The Skylands and the Depths represent an admirable amount of new content, but as neither of them are sufficiently cohesive on their own and are essentially held together by the recycled surface map, they did not succeed in lending Tears of the Kingdom a sense of unique identity to me, so much as just end up feeling like new side activities layered on top of Breath of the Wild. Alright, enough of this negativity. I have more critiques to come in the plot section, but before we move into that, allow me to cleanse your palate with a little gushing about some things I liked. First up is Link's prologue attire. Hey, my petty aesthetic tastes can go both ways, you know. I really appreciated that the low defense starting clothes had an actual design this time, and one which showcased Link's new arm. The old shirt in Breath of the Wild wouldn't have been so bad if it had perhaps been green, to add not only a splash of color, but an homage to the older Zelda titles before acquiring the Champion's Tunic. But as it stands, you spend much of your time on the Great Plateau in Breath of the Wild in this cream-colored snooze fest of a shirt. The ancient garb given to you at the start of Tears of the Kingdom, by contrast, offers something not only pleasant to look at for the prologue, but well designed enough to actually be featured in some of the game's promotional art, and I appreciated this. I was actually disappointed it couldn't be upgraded by the Great Fairy. I would have spent a lot more time in it if it could. Next, let's talk about the Zonai runes. I actually like that these are entirely new, and none of the Sheikah runes from Breath of the Wild were brought back. This is actually something I like when sequels do in general, replace a few tools and mechanics rather than simply adding new ones to old ones. It helps earlier entries maintain their sense of validity. Even if I had enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom more than Breath of the Wild, things like the completely different set of runes and dungeons and the presence of the now infamous Guardians allow the earlier title to maintain its replay value. I do have one nitpick about the Fuse rune, however, Namely, that it honestly feels like just an offshoot of the Ultra Hand. I wouldn't be surprised if Ultra Hand was originally also responsible for weapon fusion, and the devs decided that manually sticking small monster parts onto small weapons was a pain, so they splintered that function off into its own dedicated rune for quality of life purposes. As a result, however, Fusion has literally no puzzle-solving applications whatsoever, which means that outside of those naked combat test shrines, you're kind of only working with three runes instead of four. Fortunately, Ultra Hand is insanely versatile, pairs nicely with Recall, and thanks to its contraption-building abilities with these Zonai devices, it more than makes up for the one missing puzzle rune. I also love that Recall specifically is given to Link by Zelda in her capacity as the Sage of Time at the Temple of Time. That was some really cool theming. I don't have much to say about Ascend, but it was convenient and fun to use. No complaints. The Temples and Sages are also a big step up from the Divine Beasts and Champions. While I still actually really like the Divine Beasts, just for how unique and fresh they were, these temples were just way more fun and well designed. And while I did really enjoy the grand set pieces of the modern day champions helping Link board the Divine Beasts, having the sages actually accompany Link both to and through the temples was insanely cool, and I really hope we never have to go back to not having that feature. The Sage's powers in general were so much cooler, more useful, and more frequently usable than the comparatively limited champion powers of Breath of the Wild, and the fact that all Sages could be active at once was insane. It really made it feel like Link was gathering a party, which seriously, Nintendo, The Legend of Zelda RPG when? How has that not happened yet? My only nitpick with the Sages is that they really could have used some sort of swappable hotkey for power activation like the Zonai runes had. By the endgame, I felt like I was always running around sloppily sifting through a bunch I didn't need to get to the one I was looking for. 
No, no, Tulin, I, I don't need you to blow wind on those rocks. I need Unobo to smash them. No, Unobo, I, I don't need your Goron roll for those Gibdos. I, I need Riju's lightning. Sidon, where the hell are you? You are always way out of position when I need you. Seriously, though, absolute nitpick. Did nothing to diminish my love for this feature. In summation, I really, really loved all the new mechanics and story content. The stuff you experience along the main quest line. The dungeons were improved, and I loved that two of them were in the sky, one was on the surface, and one was in the depths. I loved how each made active use of the corresponding sage's unique powers, and the bosses were a wholesale improvement over the Blight Ganons from Breath of the Wild. They were pretty easy overall, but they were always an incredibly hype spectacle, and easy but visually spectacular bosses are kind of a 3D Zelda staple. And as someone who doesn't play games on ball-busting higher difficulty levels, they were just fun. They were so much fun. And they have optional, more challenging variants to be found in the depths anyway, so you can rematch them every Blood Moon if you want to. Basically, the main adventure of Tears of the Kingdom was nothing short of wonderful. And while I cannot imagine myself ever having the patience to replay this entry to anything resembling completion, if I ever do return to it, it'll probably be as a sort of brisk challenge run where I primarily ignore the side content. Not because I like challenge runs, but because the main quest line felt like a genuinely worthy successor to Breath of the Wild for me. In a way, the extraneous exploratory content simply didn't, thanks to the recycled map. And with that, we have officially reached your full spoiler warning. Going forward, I'll be going into the full story, late game surprises, and final events. So if you have more yet to go in your first playthrough, then this is where I suggest getting off the ride. I hope you'll return when you're finished. Spoilers start now. Okay, first off, a couple quick gushes about surprise gameplay moments. First of all, I love what Tears of the Kingdom did with the Yiga clan forcing most of their presence into the depths, and treating them as a sort of mechanical foil to the player by having them serve as contraptionists who make use of the same Zonai devices that Link does. They have hideouts with unique blueprints scattered all over the depths, each guarded by some intimidating, unnatural contraption of theirs, and the recurring boss fight with Master Koga made me so happy. They were like a more proper realization of the Gruntilda battles in Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, and God, I wish the Tears of the Kingdom team could legally produce a follow-up to that game. I have to say, Tears of the Kingdom in general stands less as a worthy successor to Breath of the Wild for me, as it does a testament to how insanely ahead of its time Nuts and Bolts was. I mean, that game came out in 2008, Jesus Christ. If Rare had just found a way to layer those new mechanics on top of Banjo's classic moves and exploratory gameplay, then I am convinced that franchise would still be going strong to this day. Tears of the Kingdom's building mechanics aren't even quite as robust as Nuts and Bolts's, but because it has Breath of the Wild's fundamental design as its foundation, the contraption building elements are just another insanely versatile tool in your toy box, and I completely understand why this marriage of gameplay elements overshadows Tears of the Kingdom's faults for so many players, and makes them feel like it's such a massive leap from Breath of the Wild, even despite the recycled game world. Master Koga and the Yiga clan essentially stand as tribute to all of Tears of the Kingdom's best new mechanics, and my skirmishes with Koga were among my favorite moments in the entire game. Also, the fifth and final sage, Minoru, holy cow, way to take the single most boring character in the entire game and turn her into one of my absolute favorites right at the very end. Incredible. The intrigue surrounding how you find her is cool enough, but that she manifests as a customizable mech construct that you can ride whenever and wherever you want in this massive world? Oh my god! She is so fucking cool! She almost made me forget about all my problems with the game once I acquired her. 
honestly, even though I've completed the story's finale, I think I'm gonna be diving back in to wrap up some missing collectibles and shrines just as an excuse to spend more time with her. And as someone who didn't produce pointlessly convoluted feats of Zonai engineering just for the fun of it during my playthrough, Minoru also represents the first moment I became actively attached to my upgraded battery. Honestly, just as there are stat checks for your heart containers and stamina meter at various points in the game, I think there should have been a stat check for player battery level before acquiring Minoru, because I cannot imagine how much less I would have enjoyed her had I not upgraded my battery at all before this set piece. Fortunately, I did though, and it was an absolute blast. And that boss fight with the corrupted construct she had originally built for herself was the most epic game of Rock'em Sock'em Robots of all time. It was crazy easy, but I had the biggest grin throughout that whole sequence. It was such a highlight for me. Also, did anyone else notice her similarities to an ARMS character? The shoulder button punches were highly reminiscent of that game, and her blocking animation was legitimately ripped straight out of it. Anyway, I want to take a look at the game's narrative next, but before I do, I want to take a moment to expand on this idea of Zelda games having unique atmospheres and identities, because I feel like I didn't really do this justice earlier while talking strictly gameplay, but it's central to my biggest personal issues with Tears of the Kingdom. A game's atmosphere is a hard thing to pin down with words, so bear with me here. Certainly the art style and music help, which is definitely one of the central things that help each mainline Zelda title stand apart, from Ocarina of Time, to Wind Waker, to Twilight Princess, to Skyward Sword, to Breath of the Wild. But Majora's Mask was also a direct sequel with a recycled engine and assets, and it managed to have arguably the most striking and unique atmosphere of the entire series. So why is that? Well, for one, it actually takes place in a brand new world with a brand new map, and exciting new rules that apply to it. But even during the game's very opening, before you've even reached Clock Town, Majora's Mask manages to set a very distinct mood that's pretty much never been replicated since. The story opens with the hero of time gloomily riding his horse in a misty, foreboding woods. The hero of time is an inherently tragic figure, as he now lives in a timeline where saving the world meant all his previous exploits were erased from history, and many of the friends he made along the way no longer remember him. He was forced to grow seven years in an instant, only to return to his child form while having already lost his youth and innocence. Anyway, he's slowly plodding along on Epona, searching for his lost fairy companion with this moody, melancholic melody playing, when he gets ambushed by a forest imp with two fairies of his own. I think this is such a cute character-building moment for this incarnation of Link. He may be the hero who conquered three dungeons, five temples, and slew the thief king Ganondorf, but at the end of the day, he's still a somewhat clumsy kid, not a shonen anime character who never lets his guard down, even when they're alone. Anyway, this imp, the Skull Kid, manages to mug him, stealing not only his horse, but the very ocarina of time itself. Not just an incredibly powerful and valuable relic, but the only remaining link that uh, Link has to his previous adventure, and the princess who gave it to him. So he pursues Skull Kid into a hollowed out tree, and as he's hopping across the stumps leading into it, he starts doing flips, and the first time I saw this, I lost my mind. I was like, oh, I played Ocarina of Time and he never did flips before, this is so cool. Look how much more experienced and like acrobatic he is now. I know this is silly, but little touches like this are something I really miss from older games, where devs had to imaginatively work around smaller budgets and weaker hardware to engage in subtle storytelling by way of little details like this. Like, you can throw as many epic, high-budget Ganon resurrection scenes at me as you want, but nothing will ever get me going the way seeing Link start doing flips does every time I start up Majora's Mask. 
Anyway, when Link finally catches up to this guy, he's enveloped in a magical haze and forcibly transformed into a Deku Scrub, which in Hyrule are like these barely sentient low-level monsters. He sees his reflection in the pond in front of him and reacts in abject horror. And thus, barely five minutes into this game, the thoroughly accomplished hero of time, the guy who's already defeated the king of evil and undone seven years of his reign, has now been stripped of his equipment, his horse, his most valuable possession, and even his humanity and his very dignity. Oh, and also his sick flips. Meanwhile, the little shit who took these things from him wasn't some dark lord looking for revenge, he was an insignificant forest dweller who had accidentally acquired Majora's Mask, a dark, soul-corrupting relic imbued with tremendous and terrible power. He's hovering across the pond in a reclined position, haphazardly tossing the priceless ocarina of time that he stole up and down with one hand, not even realizing its power and value. And in order to pursue him any further, Link now has to adapt to this new body on the fly and dive ever deeper into this haunting, mysterious, enormous tree hollow, pass through a gateway to a parallel world, and directly confront this terrible fate he's been saddled with. When he finally emerges into sunlight, he's in a completely foreign land a bustling town with an ominous moon primed to fall on it. And because he's a Deku scrub now, the freaking Scottish terriers prancing around town attack him on sight. It's a strange, dangerous, fascinating new world, and there are still so many more wild new discoveries yet to come. You see, the depths just are not comparable to someplace like Termina, which is an entirely new overworld with varied weather, terrain, flora, and fauna, and even some new races like the fully sentient and civilized Termina Deku Scrubs. The depths don't really have their own rules, they're just dark and infested with Ganon's gloom and a couple of new monster species. The Great Sky Island, where Link's adventure in Tears of the Kingdom begins, almost immediately gives way to the familiar and inviting presence of Hyrule, and all of the Hero of the Wild's established friends and confidants. He has a few new zones to bravely chart, but he has a cozy home base to come back to, where everybody knows, loves, and respects him. To be fair, this creates a deliberate feel-good atmosphere of its own, but it isn't really any different from Breath of the Wild's atmosphere, where Link already had a pre-established relationship with many of the more important NPCs. It doesn't really lend Tears of the Kingdom its own identity, so much as a further sense of continuity with its predecessor. Furthermore, Tears of the Kingdom is frankly just as much of a soft reboot of Breath of the Wild as Twilight Princesses of Ocarina of Time, if not more so. You still have approximately 50% of the major story content occurring in the distant past. You still have non-linear collection of those lost memories, and you even have a second hyper-advanced ancient civilization lost to history. Like, oh my god, did we really need two of these? I'll give the Zonai points for feeling reasonably distinct from the Sheikah, but this is literally the same exact concept again. And you're really gonna sit there and tell me Tears of the Kingdom is the greatest, freshest game ever, but you don't respect Twilight Princess because it vaguely resembles Ocarina of Time in tone and structure? Give me a break! And speaking of non-linear memory collection, let's talk about these titular Tears of the Kingdom. While the concept is directly lifted straight out of Breath of the Wild, this game has made a few alterations to it, to, I would say, mixed results. While the lost memories in Breath of the Wild technically took place in an explicit chronological order, they were mostly focused around individual character building moments. They were really used to flesh out the personalities of Zelda, the champions, and Link's relationship to them. This led Breath of the Wild to have a relatively underbaked central plot, but it was inherently well paired with the nonlinear aspect of their collection. The order you viewed them in was intentionally designed not to matter because you could acquire them in any order. 
The geoglyph tiers in Tears of the Kingdom, however, take place in a much more explicit chronology, and are clearly meant to be viewed in chronological order for maximum satisfaction. To the game's credit, you are gently guided towards the Forgotten Temple early on, where you can find a map not only leading you to each of them, but displaying the order in which they are meant to be viewed. So even if they are acquired out of order, it's easy to piece together the chronology and rewatch them in the Pura Pad, which also explicitly labels their intended sequence for you. But I really don't think that this non-linear collection angle suits a more linear set of scenes, and it ended up hurting the pacing of my tier acquisition. First of all, there's a reason that books, movies, and television shows aren't presented to you in a jumble of isolated scenes with a written list telling you what order to watch them in. Narratives have arcs, they have flow. If you have an explicit chronology, then presenting your story to a viewer in an asynchronous, scattershot fashion is only going to hurt their viewing experience and rob many larger beats of their intended punch. In my case, I acquired the first two tiers quite early, so right off the bat I had an idea of what had happened to Zelda after the prologue, but my journey across Hyrule ended up leading me into a location convenient for acquiring a tier that was just one scene ahead of where I should have been. So I thought, okay, well, I'm only skipping one scene, maybe this won't be so bad. And then the scene I ended up viewing was this epic sequence of Ganondorf just unceremoniously existing and sicking an army of Moldegas on Zelda and her new friends from out of nowhere, and I was like, oh my god, what the hell did I miss? I then spent the next few hours wondering what Ganondorf's actual intro and build-up were going to be, only to discover that the scene I had skipped was this totally boring, unrelated scene of Zelda visiting a fucking library. But this also meant that Ganondorf got no proper introduction. I mean, I know this guy's reputation precedes him, but like, this is a new story. And at this point, I was playing the game blind, and I didn't even really know for sure if he was the Demon King. Like, I I don't know, maybe the Demon King is Demise, he sure looks like him. Maybe Ganondorf will have a surprising role to play as a rival third-party faction villain. You can't just drop your antagonist on the viewer like that with no introduction, guys. Jesus Christ. I know we met dehydrated Ganon in the prologue, but this scene is his first chronological appearance within the game's narrative. Don't you think a little more build-up for who he was in the past was in order, Aonuma? Anyway, after this turn of events, I became paranoid about spoiling cool sequences for myself by viewing them out of order, so I was determined to only view the rest of the tiers in the sequence laid out for me by the hidden chamber in the Forgotten Temple. The only problem was, the next tier I needed was in the Gerudo Desert, which was the last place I visited because I was following the suggested temple order laid out by Pura over at Lookout Landing. So I ended up doing the next, like, three to four real-world days of playtime with no progression on the tier story whatsoever, marking down literally every other geoglyph location on my map as I organically came across them, and then marathoning all of them as soon as I reached that one in the Gerudo Desert. This also meant that I had done the three temples before then, and redundantly received those identical narratives about the imprisoning war with the Demon King, rendering a few of the final tiers utterly unsurprising. Which leads me into my next point about Tears of the Kingdom copying Breath of the Wild storytelling formula. One of the few flaws I felt Breath of the Wild to have. Narrative redundancy. Since much of the game is technically optional, the developers felt the need to write double backups of all the major plot points into the various acquirable cutscenes. The mystery of what happened to Zelda and where she currently is is a really cool idea, and I like that she had some actual agency in the plot this time around. But it's exceedingly easy to figure out that she's turned into the Light Dragon within the first, like, 10 to 15 hours of play, maybe less, depending depending on what order you do things in. But there's no actual narrative flag for this event, so even after you've literally collected all the tears and the Master Sword, Pura and the gang still talk to you like, Duh, I wonder where Princess Zelda is, and Link just stands there and doesn't tell them. 
This revelation is also rightfully framed as a tragic event. This poor incarnation of Zelda not only spent 100 years keeping Calamity Ganon at bay, but has now spent countless eons roaming the skies as an immortal dragon, desperately clinging to what fragments of sanity and will she had left. So knowing all this, it felt extremely tonally incongruous being asked to ride around on her for 40 minutes, farming scales, claws, and other refuse body parts in order to upgrade my champion's leathers. Seriously, that design decision was in exceedingly poor taste. Finally, I want to say a few words about the Zelda timeline. Guys, I really don't think Nintendo cares about that thing. I've always been a bit skeptical of the Hyrule Historia because it pretty much just directly copied the prevailing fan theory of the time and then added a totally arbitrary extra branch to make it look original. Breath of the Wild then went on to incorporate elements from all of the previous timelines in the form of direct verbal homages to games from across all of them, to say nothing of one-off Wind Waker races like the Rito and Koroks returning. And it took place so unfathomably far in the future that the Sheikah from Ocarina of Time had somehow become a hyper-advanced super race, died off, and then passed into legend over thousands upon thousands of years. So even if Breath of the Wild does somehow exist on one of those timelines, does it really matter? Finally, we arrive at Tears of the Kingdom, which clearly has its own canon for, like, pretty much everything. You can bend over backwards trying to make it fit with pre-established lore, but honestly, I don't think the developers gave it as much thought as you. I respect their desire not to be constrained, but yeah. First of all, the era Zelda travels to seems to predate even Skyward Sword, since neither the Master Sword nor even the Goddess Sword natively exist in that period. Hylia isn't even mentioned, but the Kingdom of Hyrule is already being established, despite Skyward Sword not happening yet, and Ganondorf already exists, despite this apparently being pre-demise, who he looks extraordinarily similar to when transformed, but is supposed to be a reincarnation of. Hell, they even share the title of Demon King, a moniker which Ganondorf was never associated with previously. On top of all this, the Triforce isn't utilized in the plot in any capacity, instead making use of these Magatamas, I, I, I mean secret stones. Ganondorf has always been interesting to me, because unlike Link and Zelda who constantly reincarnate, Ganon is always implied to be the same guy from Ocarina of Time, ostensibly being granted some measure of immortality by the Triforce of Power. But Hyrule's founding should predate Ocarina of Time by definition, and yet here is Gerudo Ganondorf in the flesh with no prior relationship to a swordsman named Link. My point is, Tears of the Kingdom practically goes out of its way to fly in the face of the Zelda timeline. Beyond this though, the story it does have to tell is fun, and the cutscenes which convey it are enjoyable to watch, barring the incredibly redundant Sage Awakening scenes, which even seem to share a word-for-word -word script, just plugging in the corresponding Sage element and race name. Having the modern-day sages not only receive some agency in the narrative, but also adventure alongside Link, complete with acknowledgement in the game's mechanics, is just an objective, decided improvement over Breath of the Wild's long-dead champions. And the finale? This is the one aspect of Tears of the Kingdom I genuinely say blows Breath of the Wild's corresponding sequence almost completely out of the water. While I definitely prefer Breath of the Wild's conception of Hyrule Castle to the relatively brief linear gauntlet through the depths beneath Hyrule Castle in Tears of the Kingdom, the final battle in Tears is just so much more hype, challenging, and fun. I actually didn't hate Calamity Ganon in Breath of the Wild. I thought the fact that he was an absolute freak and a bit of a visual clusterfuck was in line with that game's interpretation of his character. And also, just another aspect of the game that was surprisingly fresh and original in how utterly bizarre it was. Seeing him manifest as this grotesque amalgamation of the ancient Sheikah tech he had magically commandeered was certainly spooky in its own right. 
Having said that, I do think that, as the series' most iconic villain, Ganondorf deserves the more faithful yet striking design he received in Tears of the Kingdom. Anyway, first off, the battle at the gate to Ganon's chamber, where all the sages show up in the flesh to fight alongside you, is so goddamn cool. It's fun, it's epic, and when all the previous temple bosses showed up resurrected and the sages told Link to go on ahead without worrying about them because they'd grown strong enough to tackle them without his help, I was just so proud of them. Just such a proud dad. Secondly, although he's rather inconsistent with pre-established series chronology, this is easily my favorite incarnation of Ganondorf to date, both in terms of visual and combat design. He's by far the most intimidating Ganondorf we've ever seen. His evil laugh is genuine nightmare fuel, and he looks like he weighs 400 pounds of pure, undiluted muscle. He uses a compelling mix of magic and swordplay, incorporating the best elements of his Ocarina, Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess boss fights. And he's accompanied by a fantastic remix of the Calamity Ganon theme from Breath of the Wild in later phases. Additionally, he's just genuinely challenging, assuming you're like me and haven't completely mastered the flurry rush. In the second phase of the fight, he can actually dodge your counters, forcing you to counter him twice consecutively to even damage him. And the bastard can permanently destroy your heart containers, like holy crap, get out of here you asshole, that's against the rules. Also, I found that the shields in this game were insanely durable. The ones I picked up in Hyrule Castle early on when I went to retrieve the champion's leathers lasted me literally the whole game, until this fight. But Ganon then proceeded to unceremoniously shatter each of them in two measly hits. He is strong. For what it's worth though, I haven't explicitly tested this, but I think the Master Sword becomes unbreakable during this fight. I was using it for what felt like way longer than usual, and it never even got low on power, let alone ran out of it. If this is indeed the case, then it was a very appreciated gesture for the finale. Of course, the final phase of this fight mirrors Breath of the Wilds in terms of sacrificing difficulty for the sake of spectacle, but it's still a blast, and continues the Zelda tradition of having the titular princess directly assist Link in the final battle, now in her new draconic form. She kind of covers you from Dragondorf's fire, keeping him occupied while you get in close to hack away at his weak points with the Master Sword, and catches you when you fall too far beneath him. She's a good catch, too. Very reliable. All in all, I thought it was a worthy climax, and I actually teared up when Zelda had her humanity restored by Raru and Sonya amplifying the recall power Link had gotten from her at the start of the game, and then Link had to desperately reach out to her as they free fell from that insane altitude. It was a powerful finale. A little while ago, I made a video called The Terrible Power of Bad Endings, and it was about how unsatisfying or poor taste endings can retroactively ruin good experiences. I'm happy to say that Tears of the Kingdom is decidedly the opposite of this. Not that the experience itself was at all bad in the important ways, by any means, but despite all the gripes and sense of been there done that which pervaded a good portion of my playthrough, I found the finale to be so satisfying that it kind of softened my take on the game as a whole. That said, Tears of the Kingdom still did not set my world on fire. I don't see myself returning to it nearly as frequently as Breath of the Wild, which it not only did not replace for me, but actually put me in the mood to replay yet again. And I'm not ashamed to say that my love for Breath of the Wild is partially a result of it having come first. That does have value to me. But I also still really like its exclusive elements, like the snappier Sheikah runes and the no-nonsense non-rusted weapons. Additionally, I think that Breath of the Wild's map was the perfect size. It was gargantuan without being exhausting and bloated, and this is another reason I'm more inclined to return to it over Tears of the Kingdom. To me, Breath of the Wild was and remains a transcendent experience, something that exceeds the limitations of a 10 out of 10 scale, a masterpiece both in a vacuum, but especially within the context of its original release. Tears of the Kingdom, then, is to me a proper 10 out of 10, but nothing more. 
I know that sounds silly, but it's the difference between an objectively brilliant game and one with a truly original soul. Tears of the Kingdom is technically better than Breath of the Wild in many ways, but ironically, despite the fact that it's a direct sequel, I think it's a better title for those that didn't experience Breath of the Wild, because to those people, everything is new, and that newness is where both of these games really shine. Having said all that, my biggest gripe with Tears remains the fact that it genuinely does just feel like Breath of the Wild again for better and worse. It had the potential to have a fully unique identity, but I feel it kind of dropped the ball by recycling its primary setting. And the spooky opening scene where Ganon eerily awakens and the Master Sword gets destroyed came so close to giving me those chilling Majora's Mask vibes I've been looking for all these years, but it isn't really representative of the rest of the experience, so it's too much of a tonal outlier to lend its atmosphere to the rest of the game. On the whole, though, I still enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom tremendously, and I'm glad it's getting such an overwhelmingly positive reception, because it genuinely deserves it. I just hope it doesn't keep up this strange propensity for inspiring people to claim that it invalidates Breath of the Wild by virtue of its very existence. And while I positively adore this incarnation of Hyrule, it is by far my favorite one to date, I really hope that we can leave Hyrule behind for a bit and go somewhere new next time. After all, I'm sure it'll always be waiting for us to come back.